Excellent. All right. Um, I just wanted to welcome everybody to our talk by Chris Beck today. Um, we're super excited to hear some of the great tips he has. Um, he's a proud Purdue alum and um, now works remotely full time. So I think his advice is particularly timely um, for many of us who are just getting started on that path. So um, Chris, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you and thank you for being here today. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we're, we're in the situation where my advice is useful here, but I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, as, as Brooke said, I am a very proud Purdue alum. Um, I graduated in uh, 99 with a bachelor's in EE and then in uh, 02 with a master's in ECE. And uh, let's see, I'm a Purdue grad, my wife's a Purdue grad, my brother's a Purdue grad, three of my sis all three of my sisters-in-law are Purdue grads, my mother-in-law just retired from Purdue recently. And uh, I basically lived in the HCAN lounge during my entire time at Purdue. So uh, yeah, I, I have nothing, nothing but warm feelings. I hope that someday my son goes to Purdue as well. So I'm very happy to give any, any help I, at all I can. Um, let's see, I've got about 20 minutes-ish of, of kind of prepared remarks that I'd like to talk about, kind of how to work remote and just ways that have worked for me and things that might be helpful. And then after that, um, uh, Brooke has sent me a ton of great questions that you all have submitted online. And then there's a Q&A widget within the, um, within the Zoom app. If you can submit questions there, I can answer those as well. I know this, I guess this class, this session is 4.30 to 5.30. Um, I don't have a hard stop at 5.30 Eastern time, so I'm happy to keep going as long as we keep going. So don't, uh, don't worry about getting cut off for time. Or if we're, if we're all out of questions in a few minutes, then we can be done too. But um, I'll, I'll do the best I can to, uh, to answer anything I can. First, I need to say I do not speak for iRobot. Um, I, I barely speak for myself, honestly. I'm basically a stranger on the internet giving out advice, so obviously take it with a huge grain of salt. Um, what I've been doing works for me, but I don't know you. I'm not in your situation, so you know, don't <laughs> don't take anything I'm saying with uh, without a big grain of salt. So that being said, um, I've been working for about 20 years, um, 18 years, depending if you include any co-op time or anything like that. But uh, I've been working in offices at a variety of different companies for for that time, and for the last five years, I've been working full time from home for a robot. Um, I work out of my home. This is just like a, a guest bedroom in my house that is a home office, which is basically a desk and computer and, and, and some windows with some good light. That's basically it. Um, so I'd like to start by making a couple comments that are perhaps unneeded, but I feel like I should just to, to talk about the current situation. These are unprecedented times. I mean, the word unprecedented is absolutely going to be worn out by, by every, everything, uh, everything going on in the world right now. Um, it's okay to be anxious and scared about your health, about your family, about the state of the world, about your job prospects, about everything. Um, you know, I've heard this called a once in a century event, and I, I think it absolutely is, or perhaps even more. Um, it, it's, it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be anxious. I am. Many people are. Um, it's also okay to admit that to other people, like I just did to 112 people who I don't even know. Um, it's good to talk about that with those around us as, at well, as well, like at work and with friends, like we're talking about it and saying, hey, you know, admitting, admitting what you're feeling about it is a huge um, way to kind of reclaim some of your mental health and, and to sort of admit that, hey, it's okay, we're all going through this together. This is not something that any of us wants to have happen, but it is happening. And so let's sort of deal with that together. Um, when I was at Purdue, they were, they were Purdue had uh, mental, mental health counseling. Um, so psychologists and therapists and people who, who students could go to, if you are feeling particularly overwhelmed, or even if you're not feeling particularly overwhelmed, um, make, make yourself, uh, you know, find out where those resources are. And I've, I've got to think that Purdue is figuring out how to deliver those remotely. Um, I, I hope that, I hope that Purdue is, um, you know, that people are professionals at talking about anxiety and depression and stress. And, uh, this, this is the time to take advantage of that and to, to realize it's a real thing. It's normal to have in this time. And, uh, yeah, that's just my, again, my uh, free advice right there. Um, so the, the main topic here today is talking about remote work or working from home. Now I'm gonna use the phrase working from home to mean you know job work, but I also mean study work. Obviously like when I work from home, I'm working a job. And when you work from home, that means you're studying, you're listening to lectures, you're doing homework, you're doing projects. Some of you probably have part-time jobs or full-time jobs outside of, outside of school. So. I'm gonna to try to make it apply to sort of any time you are by yourself sitting in front of a computer 
trying to learn or work or do something like that. And hopefully it's applicable to all of that. Um, so the, 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 the minimum sort of advice I could give is, I guess, distilled down to the phrase, you know, we are creatures of habit. So this, the key that I think is to successfully working from home is to set up a daily routine and develop a habit of following that routine. And what I mean by a routine is that you sit down in the same place at the same time every day and you do the same thing. Now that sounds kind of boring, perhaps that sounds kind of, um, kind of too regular, but as you develop a habit of following a routine, your brain will actually get used to it and your brain will actually make it easier to follow that routine the more you do it. The, the reason that we're creatures of habit is that because our brain likes getting us into habits, whether they're good habits or bad habits. And so for working from home, set a routine and, um, and stick with that habit and kind of make it a habit. And that is the first step towards kind of being effective at working from home. Let's see, it looks like um, in the chat here, I'm gonna say this, it looks like um, Brooke has said that ECE 39401 and ECE 49401 students look for the mental health resources that I mentioned in the tips from Brooke folder on Piazza. So that's fantastic. I'm glad, I'm glad that you all are addressing that as well. Um, so let me tell you about my routine. And this is just my routine. Obviously, you know, I, I'm at home. I have an eight to five-ish kind of a job. It's going to look different for students. But when I say routine, what, what I mean is I get up, I eat my breakfast, I get my son ready for school, or nowadays I get him ready for being at home. Um, I get dressed, I make coffee, and I go up to my work desk with my cup of coffee in hand by 8 a.m. And I actually tell my wife, I'm, I'm going to work now or I'm off to work, even though I'm just walking up the stairs and, and going into this room. So I'm not commuting really anymore, but I even say something, I'm going to work now as a sort of a silly, but it's also kind of a trigger. It's a habit that I've developed that kind of starts my day. And I've been doing it now for five years and it is a very automatic thing. I don't have to think about it. I just, I get up and that is my Monday through Friday. And that is what I do. Um, now I do this routine, whether I'm excited or whether I'm bored or I'm a little sleepy or whether I'm, you know, kind of like, eh, I don't really want to go work today. I, I do it every day as if it were a regular, you know, I go to work job. And the reason I do it is because I'm a professional and it's my job. Now, if I stopped showing up for work, eventually my, my boss would probably have something to say about that. But I, I think of myself as a professional and I, I've tried to like kind of cultivate the mindset, hey, I'm a professional. Being a professional means I show up and I do a good job whether or not I'm feeling it. Some days I'm not feeling it. Some days I don't want to, I don't want to do it. Um, it's not that I'm feeling sick. Some days, you know, I feel more into my job. Some days I feel less into my job. And I mean, I can remember back from undergrad and grad school that that was always the case. It was always a fluctuation of whether I'm feeling it or whether I'm not feeling it. And being a professional and making, having a routine and sticking with that as a habit means that you're doing that whether you feel it or not. Um, so I just gave you kind of a picture of a routine for students, I imagine, and maybe I'm totally wrong here, but I imagine as you all are at home, you're probably watching lectures, um, which are probably pre-recorded, and so that is that is one block of time. And then you're probably doing homeworks, and you're probably doing projects as well. Assuming that most classes are keeping with the, the normal flow that I remember from undergrad and grad. Um, I don't know what a routine looks like for you. I don't know what kinds of time you have in the day. I don't know what kinds of spaces you have in your home or your apartment or wherever you're living, but if you can carve out a place in your home that is the school place or the workplace and it is only used for work so that when you go sit down in that area your brain says okay we are working and when you are elsewhere in your house your brain can not be working you're at home you're doing whatever else um, if you if you can kind of carve out some area where you can just have that is that is where i work that'll again help your brain get kind of okay i'm in the zone i'm going to do the work thing the thing that is my habit when i'm here furthermore if you can set aside time every day, maybe you set aside 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. and you watch lectures and then have lunch, do whatever else. And then from 1 to 3 p.m. is your homework time or you know, 5 p.m. till 10 p.m., whatever your schedule. Again, I, I have no idea what your schedule is. Obviously, you, you, you work that out. But if you can set regular times, your brain will work with you as you do it more and more to kind of get into it. The, uh, the key there is to be flexible with it, too. You know, you try something, try it for a week. See if it works. If it doesn't work, ditch it. I mean, that's true of any of the advice that I'm giving here. If, if it doesn't work for you, forget about it. Ignore it. There's no, there's no laws about this. There's no, there's no, what works for me may not work for you. 
and uh, your situation may not be very regular. Maybe you have weird hours at a job that you have to keep. And so you can't keep a regular time, but maybe you can keep a regular place or maybe you can keep three regular places or maybe you can have a separate place for video watching maybe because you're on the go, but hopefully you're, you're not on the go very much nowadays, or maybe you, you need uh, different places at different times. So whatever works for you, be flexible. You know, the first thing you try probably is not going to work 100% of the time, but if you can kind of expect that and roll with it, um, you might find something that works for you. So I've got, I've got a few tips that I want to go through that kind of help um, help me stick with routines anyway. Um, again, if, if it sounds interesting, if it sounds like it works great, if, if it doesn't sound like it's a match for you, ignore it, totally fine. The first thing uh, is patience. So you're going to have to have patience with yourself and those around you. I mean, as I said before, these are unprecedented times and you're going to get frustrated, frustrated. You're going to get stressed, you know, whether it's classwork or the videos or the internet going down or whoever else is maybe living with you being too loud or too distracting, or you've got too much other stuff going on. It's, it's totally expected to get frustrated and stressed by this. It's okay. If you can make some sort of a calm routine out of it, I guarantee you it will get easier to work from home to, to do school from home over time but expect that building the discipline and building the focus to stick with those habits is gonna take time. Be patient with yourself. Another method for kind of sticking with something is accountability. So what that means is if you can tell a friend or two, hey, this is my schedule. I'm, I'm gonna watch the class videos from one till 3 p.m. Eastern time, whatever it is. Furthermore, you, uh, for, first of all, you just telling somebody that, that there's a little bit of a promise in there. Suddenly you've, you've told them, hey, I'm gonna do this and there's an expectation that you're going to actually do it. You're going to follow through with it. If you can somehow sync up with a friend or two and say, hey, let's let's watch them together from one to three, you know, you get on Slack or get on Discord or whatever and say, hey, I'm here watching the videos. You know, any, any kind of activity where you have someone else who's expecting you to be there is going to make you a little bit more likely to actually show up. And yeah, sure, you can blow them off. But if you know someone's waiting for you or at the very least expecting you to be there, that's a little mind trick to help you, help you kind of follow through with it. This is the reason why personal trainers and workout buddies is, is, is a, another good way to, to get exercise in, to get anything done. Because if you know someone's waiting for you, you're way more likely to not just sit in your butt on the couch, but to actually get up and go and do the thing that you're trying to do. So accountability. Another tip is uh, repeatability. Um, Jerry Seinfeld, in the comedian, he has this tip for writing where he, he prints out a physical giant um, calendar every month and he marks just an X through every day where he writes stand-up comedy. And so if you print off a big calendar and if you, you know, put an X through every day that you actually manage to do your routine, you know, most of your routine, then after three, four or five days of marking this off, again, your brain's gonna get used to seeing that little pattern going. And then even if you're not feeling it, or especially if you're not feeling it one day, you've got a string of 12 Xs going, you've got a string of 12, you know, successes going, that's gonna be a little extra motivation to say, all right, at least I can try starting my routine. At least I can sit down and watch one video. At least I can try one homework problem when you're not feeling it. And then that'll, that'll kind of, you know, be a gateway into maybe doing a couple more problems. And by the end of it, you can mark that square off and you have yet another day in your track record of doing things successfully. Um, this, this might be personal preference here, but everything I've learned about learning is that basically if your brain has to work hard to learn something, it will remember it better than if your brain is not really having to engage with something. So if you're just sitting there passively watching a video uh, of your professor speak and you're not writing anything down and you're not taking notes, your brain is not having to work very hard. You'll probably think that you're absorbing some of it, but you are not absorbing much uh, or as much as if you're actually taking notes. So I, I recommend physically taking notes, you know, a pad of, pad of actual like dead trees paper and physically take notes. The, the great thing about having what I assume right now, you all are probably doing recorded videos where you can pause and, and, and fast forward or rewind or play faster or play slower is that you can stop and you can write down what you think the professor just said. And the act of writing it down will tell you that, eh, I only paid attention to about half of what they were saying. Then you can rewind it, hopefully catch the other half, write it down. The very act of doing that will give you probably better comprehension, probably better learning than if you just kind of sit back and just kind of listen and listen and think, yeah, yeah, I got that. I understand. I understand. You might be fooling yourself a little bit. And again, I don't have a lot of data on that, data on that, but what little I've read about kind of the science of learning is that the more actively engaged your brain is, the more you will retain, the more you will learn. Um, the last, the last kind of tip I would say is, is sort of a more general tip and it's, it's, it's control. Focus on what you can control. 
So you can control to some extent where you work, when you work, how you work, to, to some extent. Some of you have a lot of control over there. Some of you may not have as much control. Realize what you can and cannot control. And I mean, this is sort of trite, but try to only worry about the stuff you can control and try to be okay with the stuff you cannot control. Again, that's trite. I don't have a concrete way to help you doing that, but recognizing what is in your control and what you can change and what isn't can help you again realize you know, where, where you have some agency there. Um, you can control um, some elements of your working environment. You can control your attitude to a certain degree. If you can kind of go into this thinking, okay, I'm going to learn how to learn remote. I'm going to develop skills in working from home. I'm going to learn how to make a working environment that is more conducive towards, towards working, towards learning. You have set yourself up as a learner and you've set yourself up as this is an experiment. It might go horribly wrong. Then I'll just change it and not modify what I'm doing. That will make you again mentally kind of more more likely, I think, to uh, to actually get a good outcome of this. Things you can't control are you know the coursework that is probably being given to you is the microphone and video setup of the professor who's lecturing at you. Um, you can't control the lecture content that's being sent to you. That kind of stuff you can't really do much with. However, I do want to encourage you. Your professors are all right now probably lecturing online for the first time ever or these weeks are probably the first time ever. This is new to them, and they are having to see themselves on a screen all the time. They know that hundreds of you are seeing them on the screen. They are probably worried about the situation in the world. They are probably worried about how the content is being received, if the education is useful at all, if the students are all falling asleep. Maybe they don't care, but I guarantee you many of them do. And if you send them an email after a lecture and say, hey, this thing you said resonated with me, or hey, the way that you presented this type of information was really helpful, much more helpful than the way you presented this other type of information. There's some chance that your professor might take that and first of all, be encouraged by it, which frankly, we can all use a little bit of right now. And second of all, they might keep doing the thing you like and stop doing the thing you don't like. So you don't have a terrible amount of control over the content or what's being taught right now or how it's being taught, but I guarantee your professors would like some good feedback, constructive feedback on, uh, on how things are going. If you tell them that, this sucks and I hate it. That's not terribly constructive. So I don't do that necessarily. Uh, let's see. The all right, this this is this is a little bit a little bit preachy here, but uh, but bear with me. So you can think of this the rest of the semester as an opportunity. You can think of it as an opportunity to get better at learning from home, at working from home, at working remote, and at teaching yourself to some extent how to develop new skills. Employers want people who I, I can hand you a problem and you go off and learn this problem. You know, I, I give you, hey, we're, we're, we're worried about this situation happening on our robots or in our software. Can you go learn this new skill or, you know, dive into this thing and figure it out? I don't have a curriculum for you as an employer. I don't have a textbook for you. I don't have a lesson plan. Um, I'm on a, I'm, frequently, we don't even know like what words to Google to start dealing with a new problem because that's what we're being paid to do is sort of figure out what the new problems are. You have the opportunity now to challenge yourself and to kind of push yourself to learn how to develop working by yourself, working remote, working from home, coming up with sort of a, a technique to focus and to have discipline to actually dive into topics on your own. So if you take advantage of that, then you should come out of this with, with more marketable skills, with, um, with uh, more discipline to be able to do that later in life. Um, technology is going to change an insane amount in the next 20 years. So I took an AI class in 2000-ish at Purdue, and um, it was a good class. It was kind of state of the art. And at that point, everyone knew, it was fact, that neural networks were a dead end. You know, machine learning was, was dead. It was never going to really come to anything. And uh, so that was 2000. And in 2010, the robotic algorithm that actually drives our robots, that does the, the mapping part of our Roomba robots, was basically only available to, to a PhD thesis. So it was brand new research and you know, state of the art 2010. In 2020, basically you get machine learning, neural networks, self-driving cars, the SLAM algorithm, which is the, the thing that drives our robot. You get that by importing one line in a Python library. So I guarantee you, your, your career is gonna be about 40 years long or so. Over that 40 years, I guarantee you there's gonna be 40 new technologies that come out or 40 new directions in technology. So, the more you get used to learning how to learn now, especially on your own, the better that's gonna serve you for the rest of your career, whether you stay in tech or whether you do anything else. Uh, let's see, the last comment I wanted to make before we head over to Q&A is 
is jobs. This, this is a stressful time to be looking for an internship or a full-time job. Um, I've heard that companies are canceling internships. I've heard that they're retracting full-time offers. I've heard that companies are freezing hiring. I've heard that companies are, are doing this sort of thing. Most companies are not. Most companies are kind of keeping on, keeping on. Um, I, I actually, I'm hiring two people for my team right now at iRobot. Um, you know, many companies, my friends are hiring. Some are freezing, some are freezing, but many are still hiring. Um, no matter what happens, um, I can expect that many companies will keep hiring. That does not make it easy for you if you're somebody whose internship just got canceled, or if you can't find an internship, or hopefully not, but if your full-time job offer gets rescinded, which is rare, but I've heard of it, um, it, that doesn't really help you. So if you are presented with the summer, let's say, and you have a summer, maybe you have another semester you know, to go, another year of school, what do you do over the summer if you if your internship fell through? Um, you know, obviously, if you if you have to work, then you have to work, and and I hope that the job market is such that everyone who, who wants one can get a job this summer. Um, if you have any time on your own, then if you're looking for a resume builder kind of a thing or something just to stretch your mind again to build this discipline, then I would recommend pick a project, pick a small project that requires you to learn something. You know, whether it's a little electronic gadget or build a website or learn some technology or, you know, score score a small orchestra piece. I, I, I don't know. I don't care. My point is that do something with your time that you can set a goal, kind of make some progress towards that goal. This way you can, you know, first of all, have a sense of accomplishment and a sense of like, hey, here's this thing. I kind of worked hard. I learned X, Y, Z. And here's the thing I have at the end that you can sort of show. Here's this thing that I, I created. You know, if it's tech related, if you want to do something tech related, something job related, that shows up well on a resume. Um, if, if I'm interviewing you as a new college grad and you tell me, hey, over the summer, I, you know, built, I can't, I built a set of recycling containers, recycling, like self-recycling things for my local church or my local whatever. That is also a good thing. It shows initiative, it shows discipline, it shows the ability to get a project done. It's all good. So I'm not saying you got to do a tech project over the summer. If you want to, that's great. No, you know, no resume will look worse because of a tech project, but Resumes also look good if you do you know, any kind of an end-to-end -end project on your own. That is sort of the end of the sort of written part of the um, of, uh, of what I had. I have a ton of questions that you all asked online. Let's see. Give me give me a second as I kind of go through some of the questions that came up, so I can sort of try to organize these at all. Brooke, if you have anything you want to say, well, to, to buy me some time. <laughs> While I read through some questions, that'd be great. Otherwise, just give me a second. Well, as my as my students know, I always have something to say. Um, so hopefully those tips were really helpful for you guys. I think it even gave me a few things to think about, which is awesome because as he said, we are doing this for the first time too. Um, and I've never thought so much about what's behind me or what my weird curly hair is doing as I have in the past like two weeks. Um, not stuff I'm usually that concerned about. Um, even in a live classroom, right? There's something about it being online and, and permanent in some ways um, that I think make us think about those things a little bit more. So hopefully, um, that was helpful. If you guys do have questions that you did not send to me ahead of time, feel free to put them in the chat. You can also use the raise hand feature. Um, and I think that will let Chris um, call on you for that. Um, I'll also be posting those mental health resources. They're um, available through Purdue. Um, I think it was, oh, it was, I think it was push, just put up some new ones. Um, but I will, I'll make sure that my students at least have those most recent links. Um, you ready, Chris? I am ready. Thank you okay. very much. Yeah. And yeah, if you do put your hand up, I will um, try to call on you. I'm going to try to mix it up with the written ones and some of the voice ones, and we will see. We will see how this goes. Um, so yeah, when I when I started working remote, I realized that I needed to start trimming my eyebrows. So that's that's a that's a that's TMI for you. But there you go. No one no one asked about my eyebrows. I guarantee you. Um, all right. So the there's a bunch of questions about kind of remote working that came in. There's some other questions about career stuff and like master's degree versus bachelor's degree and career stuff. And there's a bunch of, there's a few questions about tech specifically. I'm probably going to talk mostly about the remote working part. And I doubt I'm going to get to all the questions, but I'm going to do my best. Raise your hand if you have any other questions or put them in, uh, put them in the Q&A chat. So let's see, I'm just going to, I'm just going to burn through these. Um, 
What do you miss most about not working remotely? So I, I was in the office for 15 years, so not working remotely. I, I miss some of the camaraderie. I miss, you know, the, the office office chat. I miss the water cooler kind of being around other human beings. I'm I'm a introvert, but I'm social. And so I definitely miss that interaction. Um, so that, that's the thing I miss the most. Let's see, in situations where you're working on a project with shared hardware, how is your team organized to support testing? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that a little bit more meta. Um, how do you deal with shared resources and hardware when you are working in a remote situation? So, you know, I, I work in a job with, with robots, right? And so we have, we have hardware, we have actual stuff that we have to deal with. Um, the way that we work at iRobot is that two-day FedEx is, is a wonderful invention. And so they send me things, I send things back. And, you know, before, before COVID, it was actually pretty easy. Now we have to take some extra precautions with like disinfecting stuff. But our people who, who work from home, which is right now the whole company, you know, we, we have oscilloscopes at home and soldering stations at home and whatever hardware stuff we need to do our jobs. Um, we have, for the most part, tried to make everything in the office automatable and, and you know, put webcams up or just have, um, have some way to look at robots running around. Because again, we have, we have to run robots for many, many hours for testing. So try to automate that so that you can be remote and do it. And we have some stuff that has to be done manually, some stuff that hasn't, you know, it just depends on how we've done over time. Let's see. Let me try to clean up some of these tickets as we go here, just so I can keep track of the questions that are going through. Um, the, let's see, what are the difficulties with working remotely? The, the biggest difficulty is communication. Um, the, the, the watch phrase there is over communicate. So I am constantly on Slack with my team, on email with my team and hopping on Zoom calls with my team like all day long. It's perhaps a little bit more than if I was in the office, but now that everyone's at home, over communicating is key. It is, it is always a good idea to, to to send the extra email, to send the extra Slack message, to say, you know what, I think the Slack is getting confused. Let's hop on a five minute or a 10 minute Zoom call and just communicate face to face really quickly to help to, to over communicate. Um, saying things multiple times is never a bad thing. It can seem a little repetitive, but as soon as everyone's remote, I guarantee you that people are hearing different things. Even in the office, people are hearing different things, let's be honest. Um, so over communicating is absolutely the key. Let's see, what would you suggest for a new employee who is offered a job to work either remotely or in the office? Do you think there's a level of trust that is gained when working face-to-face -face as opposed to online? I think as humans, we are much, we have you know thousands and millions of years of, of being used to working together face-to-face. -to -face. So the whole remote, you know, you're just a set of 2D pixels on a screen is different for us. So it is easier, I think, to, to click and to gel and to sort of develop trust face-to-face. But having done it for five years now, many of my colleagues I've never actually met in person. I mean, I go back to the home office, to the HQ from time to time, but you know, we're constantly hiring. And so I'm constantly meeting people who I've never met in person. And I've got to say that it, it mostly works. It's not as bad as people fear, um, you know, fear that. So there's, there's a little bit to be, uh, a little bit of trust I think that has to be gained. But I think also, as, especially as we're all suddenly remote all over the place, I think everyone is pretty willing to trust and willing to say, hey, this is, this is kind of a weird new thing. We're figuring it out together. Um, I'm not sure how that applies to the normal sort of once we get back to regular life, but hopefully a little bit of that um, remains. Uh, the first part of the question was, uh, I'm assuming this person is saying if they can work remote or work in the office, what would they recommend? And that is, that is a, that's a personal question. I have no idea. Uh, it depends on the job. It depends on what the company really thinks about remote working. It depends on whether you really want to do it or not. Um, so I, I can't, I can, there's, there's way too many variables in there. If anyone ever tells you, by the way, if anyone ever tries to tell you to any kind of a question, like what should I do with my life? What should I do with this? What should I take this offer or that offer? If anyone has a definitive answer to you and doesn't say, well, it depends, then they're probably trying to sell you something. So don't, like if, if I come across as saying, this is how you should do something, absolutely. Don't listen to me because it probably means I'm wrong. There's, there's a number of questions here that are about you know, given that a lot of companies have worked, have moved to work from home, work remote, do I think that will change, you know, once we hopefully return to normal, hopefully sooner rather than later, do I think that more companies will start to say, hey, we can re work remote and maybe that will become more common. 
Um, my answer to that is it, it depends. I think people who are in leadership roles at companies, um, and we all have biases, and so they're either biased to think, yeah, maybe a remote could work, or they're biased to think, no, if you're not in a chair in front of me, I don't necessarily trust you to get your work done, or I don't think it's possible to do our jobs remote. So, we're, so whatever bias people have, whether they're kind of pro-remote or anti-remote, I think this is going to confirm that bias. Because as with any human bias, you kind of see with confirmation bias is a thing. You see the things that you believe to be true and you sort of, your, your, your mind actually doesn't see the other things. So if a company is kind of leaning towards pro remote, wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if um, remote happens more after we get back to normal. If a company is kind of anti-remote, I'm guessing they're gonna say, well, that can't possibly work, but now we can, now we proved it. The other thing that's weird here in this situation is that, you know, I worked from home for five and a half years, but all of a sudden I'm working from home with my, with my kid who's, who's he's supposed to be in school, but he's at home. And so, especially with families with two or three kids at home, especially younger kids, you know, if both parents work or if it's a single parent and they're working and they're trying to have a kid at home or whatever the situation is, that is not normal work from home. Like when schools are shut down and when daycares are shut down and when grandma can't come over to help out or grandpa can't come over to help out, then that is a stressful situation that has nothing to do with like, does remote working work? That has to do with like, does society, does society have places for children to go into our schools and in our infrastructure operational? So I think, I think we need to not confuse sort of working from home and the ability to work remote with, do we have the whole family at home? Is school up and running? That sort of thing. Hopefully it answers that kind of part of the question. Um, let's see, there's a question. Do I think a long period of remote work climate can lead to a lower hiring rate for new graduates? I don't think so. Um, I don't think companies need new hires out of college. Companies need experienced people. Obviously companies, because the economy is taking a big hit right now, hiring is going to pull back, but I don't see working from home versus not working from home as changing the overall hiring going forward. Even if 80% of companies decide to do more work from home, I don't think that changes, you know, new grad hiring versus senior hiring. I think that just changes where people sit when they get hired. Um, let's see, does anyone, let's try a live one. Does anyone have a live question they want to ask? And I can unmute your mic and you can try asking it live. If not, I have plenty of other questions, but if someone's brave enough to try asking a question live, that might be fun. Give that a minute as I look. There'll be someone who's brave enough to answer a question. All right, here we go. Let's see, we got two, I think. All right, um, uh, Jehan or Jehan? Hello, Chris. Uh, Jehan okay. here. Jehan. So you mentioned that this is a good chance to pick up some new skills online. In your experience, is it worth paying for an online certificate or a nano degree or something of that sort? And here's where, if I say yes or no, then you, gotta, you know I'm lying to you. The answer is it depends. The answer is it depends. Um, if you have something you're interested in, first of all, like Udacity and Pluralsight and a bunch of these courses are currently offering free courses. I believe Udacity has a ton of stuff for you right now. So first of all, free is an option. Second of all, is it worth paying for them? It depends. If it's something you're interested in, then it could be useful. I've done some Udacity courses that my company paid for that I probably would have paid for on my own had my company not done that. And I consider it useful because it was kind of tangentially re related to my job, but it helped me come up to speed on machine learning and, and computer vision, which was, which was a gap in my experience since, like I said, I took AI 20 years ago when it, it was not a thing. So it, it, it totally depends. Um, do I, as an employer, care if you have a certification, you know, care if you have the stamp on the Udacity course or whether you just take the free version? I, I, think, I think maybe Udacity, maybe Coursera, maybe edX, they have a number of these things that you can just do the course for free. I think they call it auditing or whatever, or you can pay 50 bucks and get a certificate of achievement. I don't really care personally. This is again, personally, may not apply to you personally. I don't care if you get the, the seal of approval. If you've done the work and can tell me about it, then that is all I care about from a hiring perspective. From your perspective, it's, are you interested in it? And then, you know, obviously having the funds to do that is a whole nother, whole nother question. Did I answer or over answer that question? No, you answered it absolutely. And I have a quick follow-up if you have the time. Yeah, yeah, go for it. With the rate at which you said that tech is progressing, 
how do you feel that what you learned from your master's degree was still worth the investment that you put into it and that is still relevant and helped you? Yes, yes. Um, so uh, there was a bunch of questions. That maybe I'll just dip, dip into this real quick. There was a bunch of questions about basically why master's? Is it worth it? Should I go back for master's? All these questions. So the, the answer is it depends. Um, I am very, very glad. So I did bachelor's, master's back to back. Um, I wanted to do chip design. I had an internship or co-op at Intel um, out of Purdue. And I was very, very fortunate. I got in there and I could see that, okay, it seems like people who are working around me, most of them have masters or PhDs. And so I want to do this type of work. I, I, I lucked into it quite frankly. And so I got a master's because that's what the people who were doing the work full time had. Most of them were masters or PhDs. So that for me was kind of like, I, I actually, okay, whatever. I, I like school. I'll, I'll, I like school. I love school. If I could be in school full time, if I could go back and get a PhD and somehow make a salary while doing it, I would, I would totally do it. Um, it doesn't, doesn't work quite the same way. But for me, it was worth it because there was a, I don't want to say job requirement around it, but because I knew that that was kind of the norm. Um, the, the stuff that I learned in masters was focused on computer architecture, compilers, chip design, and it was stuff that I was interested in and getting the breadth and the depth that I got in grad school that I did not get in undergrad because it was just, you know, you get, you get 10 more classes in grad school and you can go deeper and wider than the classes you got in undergrad. So if you're interested in a subject, if you look around to see what kinds of degrees people in that subject have, who are actually working full time have, if everyone doing, you know, hardcore robotics research at iRobot or other companies has a PhD, maybe you need a PhD to do that kind of work. Um, if you don't know what you're particularly interested in and you're not like thinking, okay, I want to do X, Y, Z, um, and you're not maybe a big fan of school, then yeah, get a bachelor's degree and get out, go get a job and see if your interests change. You know, you're going to find a job, you're going to like it, you're going to hate it, who knows? You're going to go back and forth with your interests over time. Maybe come back for a master's degree later if you figure out, I love embedded systems or I love computer architecture or, or whatever. Thank you for answering those. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Let's see. We have, let's see, another brave person who I'm going to attempt to allow to talk. Um, Malu? Yes. Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, I have a question. You said, as we were talking, you were talking, you said, this is a stressful time to find internships and jobs, and I completely agree. I want to get your personal opinion. Um, if you have not heard from an internship until now, would you recommend emailing the company or the recruiter to know if they're going to change anything or do you think a, a person should wait to be contacted? No, no, reach out, reach out, always be contacting. Okay, so here, here's, here's the inside scoop. Here's the way recruiting works inside of companies. So there, there's, there's usually two okay. groups of people at companies that do recruiting. So hiring managers. So I've got an intern this summer or a new hire that I want to hire. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a 40 hour week job and recruiting is on top of that. And unfortunately, recruiting frequently falls kind of off my radar because other things are on fire, not literally, but other things are on fire at work. And so yes. recruiting is usually not on fire unless an intern is, I don't know, at my window knocking on the door. So the, the prioritization is, is tough. It's not fair to job candidates, but I'm just saying that's how it works. And that's not, that's not me, that's not iRobot, that's just kind of across the board. You being proactive, email the recruiter, whoever you have contact with and saying, hey, just like a status update is always welcome. You know, whatever, One, do it at a respectable frequency, not every day, you know, don't find their cell phone number, and text them at night, but a respectable frequency is absolutely fine. It's also fine to end any phone call or any phone call with a recruiter or the hiring manager. When can I expect back to hear back next? That is always a good um, last question because then they can tell you, you know what? talk to me in a week and a half, or you know what, I'm on vacation for a week, to talk to me in two weeks. But that way you get them to tell you, when is it okay to get back to you? And I'm just saying it's, it's usually generally okay to, to follow up with them. Um, another piece of totally random advice, ignore it if you'd like. If you find a company who you're interested in, um, research them a little bit, go find employees of theirs on LinkedIn. Um, I don't know what the overall impression of LinkedIn is in the college student community. It's probably a giant, spam fest of old people like me, but it is useful for saying, hey, if you like iRobot, go look on there and you see, okay, here's some people. Oh, here's, here's Chris Fack. He does embedded systems. Feel free to cold email people through LinkedIn and say, hi, I'm a senior at Purdue University. I was wondering if I could have 30 minutes of your time to talk about this embedded systems job. I'm interested in this and I'd like to learn more about it. But the worst thing that I can do to you, the worst thing that can happen is you get ignored. 
And the best thing that can happen is they say, sure, I like talking about my job. We're always hiring. I'll give you a 30 minute phone call. And you know, worst case, I'm out 30 minutes, you're out 30 minutes, or worst case, I ignore you. Like it's the worst thing that's gonna happen. I've hired people because they emailed me just like that. And then I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll talk to random, literally random person from the internet. And it, it has ended, it has ended well many, many times. And the worst that happens is, hey, it's not a fit, it's not a match. They learn a little bit about iRobot. I learn a little about them. Yeah, we're both out a half an hour, but everyone wins. So don't be shy about cold emailing nicely, politely, ask for 15 to 30 minutes of a phone call. Worst case, you get ignored. Sounds good. Thank you for the advice. You're welcome. Um, I have a follow-up quick question. It's not really related. Um, it's about your time at Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, were you part of any clubs? Were you engaged with the university? Were the, some of the things you think would um, help the, um, a resume and something like that? You know, it's hard, I know. but <laughs> well, well, what I'm going to tell, tell you is I don't care. Like, I don't look at your clubs. I don't look at, if you didn't do any clubs, that's fine with me. Maybe you had a full-time job and you couldn't do any clubs. That was, I was actually my wife. My wife's a pretty good And she worked through college. So she, and we were, the other night we were talking about like, she was, she was asking me, she said, what's a call out? Do they still call the call outs at Purdue? Is that what they're called? Yeah, they do. Okay. So my wife, she actually grew up in Lafayette. She went, she went to Jeff. Um, if anyone, if anyone is, is, is townies there, but she went to Jeff and she worked a lot during college at Purdue. And so she didn't have time to do any of that. Personally, I don't look at any of that. If you have reasonable grades, if you have the courses, and if you are a reasonable sounding individual, that's all I care about. Um, however, I know that the typical advice is probably not bad advice, which is, you know, you do, you do course related or degree related clubs, it, it can't hurt. You know, whether that's IEEE or um, I, I did HCAN because I loved HCAN and I basically lived in the lounge, like I said, but you know, it really depends on your interests. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's hit a couple from the, let's see what else is there. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through this list. You guys have so many good questions. Let's see. Do you find yourself in meetings with peers more or less before uh, once you switch to full-time remote? So I, I think this question is asking, you know, I was, I was working for iRobot full-time in the office and then I moved um, to be remote. So I've, I've done both for iRobot. And the number of meetings definitely went down when I went remote because it's, if people are seeing you, they're more likely to grab you and pull you into a meeting. That's both good and bad. It's bad because it means you are no longer part of hallway conversations that happen, but it's good because you're no longer part of hallway conversations that can happen. And so I like the water cooler talk. I like being social with my coworkers, but it also is much easier to get an, a focused two, three, four hour block of time when I have to debug some code, you know, figure out what's going on, dig deep into some, some you know, new documentation and then figure out what's going on. It's much easier than if I have people chattering away from me you know, in, in a typical office environment. I can focus more on what I need to. So yeah, it's a balance as, as with anything else. Um, what factors do you consider when deciding to move working full-time remotely? Um, for me, it was basically my, my family uh, needed to move away from HQ uh, where iRobot was based and they were willing to let me work remote, which is not, not the normal thing at iRobot. There's a few of us that work remote full time before this whole thing, but uh, not many of us. So they were willing to take a chance on me and I thought I could pull it off full time and, um, and it worked out. Let's see, other questions. How do you balance between work, family, leisure time at home? Uh, this, this is a good question. What, what are the advantages um, to working from home versus in the office? Obviously no commute. I used to have an hour commute each way in Boston, depending on where I lived or where, where I was living or working at the time. So that's literally two hours a day I get back, which is amazing. Um, funny enough, I don't listen to as many uh, podcasts as I used to, and I don't, I don't read. I used to ride the subway um, for my commute in Boston. So I did a lot more reading when I had that commute, but uh, not, not so much anymore, not as much. The, the way that I balance home and, and family and work is that part of it is caused by the routine. This room is, I'm fortunate that I have a dedicated room for an office, or if you just have a dedicated desk for, for you know, your kind of your workspace. When I'm here, I'm working and I work roughly eight to five. Um, when five o'clock comes around, my wife know, and my son know that, okay, this is the accountability part. They know that, okay, Chris is supposed to be done around five o'clock. And if, if it goes over sometimes like today, they know that I'm doing this. And so it's, it's accepted, but um, 
I kind of have that schedule, I publicize it, and th these are the hours at work. And so when I get up, I am done working, and I go downstairs and do the rest of my life. Uh, and, and so I have the physical separation and also the expectation of this time we'll be in working, this time we'll be doing family stuff. So kind of segmenting it like that. Let's see, how do you stay motivated while working from home, especially at the beginning? I'm finding myself procrastinating more since I sit at home all day and I tend to forget about deadlines and assignments and you can easily click on Netflix. I totally get it. This is again, discipline is a muscle. I totally appreciate it. Discipline is a muscle and the, the habit of having, okay, at one o'clock, I will go right here and I will sit and I will work and I will do this thing and I hate it and I really want to catch up on the, the rest of Picard or whatever other TV show, I'm a nerd, um, whatever other TV show you want to watch, I get it. It's, it's very hard to, to have the discipline to do it. But the more you have the discipline, the more you're going to have the discipline. It's just like a muscle. It's just like any kind of working out where no one wants to do it at first, but over time, it gets easier. It does get easier. Um, so this is an interesting question. How do you keep track of everyone's work in a remote situation? There are many schools of thought about how, so I, I manage a team. I manage a team of six people. Um, five of my people are in, our, in the, our Boston office and one of my people is in the Pasadena, California office that we have. And some people think that a manager's job is to track work and to kind of keep track of what people are doing. And that is, that's not ever my philosophy. I don't think it's a particularly healthy philosophy. Instead, the, the goal is to trust my people to do whatever it is they need to do. So I, I, I help to set some priorities and say, hey, we need to do X, Y, Z. You know, person A, can you do this? Person B, can you do this? It's kind of my job to prioritize and to get everyone what they need to be successful and then to let them go. And, you know, obviously I, I, have, I have actually have a pretty senior team. Most of the people on my team are, many of them are much more experienced than me, actually. And so, like, I, I will add zero value by trying to keep track of what they're doing. Instead, they just do what they do and I can fortunately trust them to do that. And then they'll come to me when they're done or when they have problems or when they need priority calls. But that is something I suggest you look for in working, especially from remote situations, but look for a manager or a company that really trusts its people to do the work and to come back when there's questions. Like if you're a new college grad for my team, you're gonna have questions because it, whether you're not a new college grad, whether you're a new hire on my team at all, you don't know the iRobot software. You don't know the iRobot code or the, uh, the hardware or how we get stuff done. I expect a new hire, whether they're a new college grad or whether they've been working for 40 years to ask a billion questions, totally cool. But the goal is to answer your questions and trust you and then you know, hopefully, hopefully raise, raise people to be kind of leader, lead themselves to be able to do what they need to do and then just come back for feedback or help for the next, uh, the next item. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, if the question in fact was a, a more sort of tactical, how do you do it? You, we use wikis. So we, we use a wiki system at work to kind of track projects. We use Jira or Trello or any of these sort of task tracking systems to track a project. Here's the 83 things that need to happen. Who's working on what? We use that just to keep, keep tabs on everything. We use Slack 24 seven basically. Um, to uh, just keep track with each other, whether we're remote or not, we use Slack for that um, and similar sorts of tools. And I hope I answered one version of the question that was actually asked. Let's see. I'm reading down the list. What advice would you give to people who enjoy personal face-to-face -face interactions but are forced to work remote now? Um, we have a couple of Slack channels at work that are just like goof off, show your family pictures on there, show, you know, what's going on. Here's tips. Here's things that I did with my kids, here's things that I did with my family. So some of that kind of human element, um, we have people who are doing happy hours, uh, you know, at 4.30 PM, they start a Zoom call and the, the team joins them and everyone just kind of hangs out and there's no work agenda. It's just a chat. Um, I have a, a book club with some friends of mine who live all around the country and we read a book every week. We read like two or three chapters of, of a random book, not a random book. That sounds dumb. We, we pick a book and then we read it together and we just have a Skype call or a Zoom call every Sunday night. And this is just a way to keep FaceTime sort of with friends. And it's kind of about the book, but it's more about just hanging out with friends. So any, any kind of social distance approved way of seeing people. Um, we've, we haven't done this yet, but we've talked about having, having dinner with our friends by basically putting an iPad with FaceTime on it on our dinner table with our friends who live across town so that we can have dinner with them sitting at a table I don't know if that's silly or not, but it, um, it just, it's a random way to, to try to have a little bit of, of interaction. 
Let's see. All right, let's. I am looking. I am looking through. You guys, man, so many good questions here. All right, anyone else um, have a question they want to raise a hand for? Please do, and I will call on you and you can speak. Someone asked me, why did you decide to go to Purdue for a master's? Did you apply any places other than Purdue? You know what? I didn't because there was no application other than like, I think I had to fill out a form that said, please, can I go to Purdue? And they said yes at the time. And so I was quite happy at Purdue. Um, and so I, I, maybe I should have applied elsewhere. I'm glad I stayed at Purdue. It, it, it was good. Plus I met my wife during grad school. So extra bonus there, but uh, it's not a very applicable answer for other people, but I liked it. Let's see, answer that one. Have you ever felt that you had a lack of communication between your teammates while working on a project or managing a project? Um, plus when you work remotely, how do you not mess, uh, mess up your sleep schedule? So the way and I'll answer that second part first, um, I keep part of my, part of my schedule is that I have a regular sleep schedule. Um, and I have a young son who likes to get up in the morning. He has not yet learned what sleeping in means. So we're up in this house early, regardless of when I go to bed. So that has helped me get to bed at a reasonable time. Um, I'm, I'm a night owl by default, but having a young kid kind of <laughs> wrecks that. So that has helped me get a, get a different sleep schedule. Um, you have to prioritize going to bed at a reasonable time and getting eight or nine hours of sleep or whatever you need. Otherwise your sleep is going to be a mess. Now, when I was in college, my sleep was a mess. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you advice and I completely didn't follow that advice when I was in college, but that, that's my, that's my, that's my answer at the very least. Um, lack of communication is the biggest, the biggest problem with working remote, whether you're just remote or whether the whole team is remote. And so regular scheduled communication is key. So, you know, we have what are called standups. So three times a week, I'll meet with one team and three times a week, a week I'll meet with the other team. And it's just a half an hour call. We all get on Zoom. Um, whether, when they're in the office, they all get on Zoom. And, and now that they're at home, they're also all getting on Zoom. And we just go through the issues. Now we could do that using just one of our pieces of software that tracks our tickets, but having a little bit of the human sort of face-to-face, -face, at least via Zoom context, just helps speed thing up, speed, speed things up and makes things clear. Um, every time you type in an answer to something, there's, there's a chance of it being misconstrued or misunderstood. And so being able to see the person's face, seeing them not really getting what you're saying or seeing them like emphatically nodding along will go a long way towards clearing up any misconceptions. Does working remotely allow for a better balance between work life and home life? It depends. Um, I know people that go remote and they end up working all the time because it is way too easy to finish dinner and then do some dishes and then pick up your laptop and then 2 a.m. arrives and you're just work for six more hours. So it's, it's very easy to do that if you don't set up some boundaries. Um, I, I think it, the way that I've set it up um, and over time, you know, over five plus years have, have made it work because I think I have a much better work-life balance than, um, than when I was used to. Part of that could just be because I saved two hours of my life not commuting. Let's see here. How could the teachings of a lab-like courses be made efficient given this remote learning situation? That is a tough question. Um, my job involves hardware. I have an oscilloscope at home. I have a soldering iron at home. I can use them all and I use them for my job. Um, you know, I know that different, there's all kinds of different, I, I, I'm speaking from an ECE, you know, kind of, kind of bent. I mean, if you can have, this is a logic analyzer, costs a few hundred bucks, um, not cheap, but not terribly expensive. So I, I don't know if Purdue requires students to have uh, test and measurement gear at home. Like, do you have to have your own multimeter? But having a small lab setup like that, that is not too expensive, or maybe even provided by Purdue, goes a long way towards having sort of everyone had the same hardware, the same, same kind of base. Obviously, Purdue and everyone is sort of figuring this out on the fly. So, you know, maybe back in January, if everyone knew that, hey, everyone needs a logic analyzer at home, or everyone needs an oscilloscope at home or something, we could figure that out. But I'm guessing now everyone's scrambling. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. Uh, how is learning on the job different than learning at school? And what tips do you have to be effective at learning on the job? Um, I, I, I tried to answer that. Um, learning on the job, there are no right answers. There no, are no worksheets and frequently the thing you need to Google doesn't exist yet. Um, you know, I spend plenty of time at Stack Overflow looking for answers to questions. They're of, of varying quality. Um, I, 
the, the nice thing is that collaboration is always allowed at work and there's no, uh, there's no problems with, you know, copying up other people's answers or anything. Everyone works together all the time. And so it is a much, uh, much easier place to kind of have conversations and to build on the work of others without worrying about, um, without worrying about uh, plagiarism and all that kind of stuff. Um, I can't say that learning on the job, learning new things is still a difficult task. Like I found it, it, it was work to study in school and it is work to learn new things at work. And that will always be true. So it, it is not easier, it's just different. Let's see, anyone, is anyone brave enough to answer, raise a hand, ask a question here? Got to be somebody who has a question, even a dumb question. Dumb questions are good questions. Oh, we have a, re a second time caller. Second time caller. Oh, no, we got Amir. We're going to go for Amir first. They're a first time caller. All right, Amir. Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, just a question. You, you, so you did talk about how um, some people are suited to uh, working at, uh, at home and some people are also suited to not working at home, like me working in the office. Uh, how would you deal with, uh, like, uh, say, someone who's, like, really just not um, apt to working at home? They're more used, they're basically better than working in the uh, office than working at, uh, uh, at home. Um, all right, so a good question. So first, I, I would say no one, no one's really going to be better or worse than working at home. It's most people, again, we have, we have years and years of evolution that kind of makes us working face-to-face, -face, like, in real life. So working remote is a skill and uh, that can be developed and no one just kind of falls into it and immediately, hey, firing on all cylinders and everything's great. So I would say there, there needs to be the expectation that it's going to be work and trial and error and some things are going to go well and some things are not going to go well. Um, the, there, there's a lot of, if you just Google around for it, there's a lot of ways to sort of find the balance between work life, you know, make a routine, come up with ways to get social connection, to get communication happening. And so I, I touched on some of the things here. I would say that the expectation is that anyone who is working remote is going to have to work a little bit harder to establish communication, to establish relationships, and to communicate. Once you have more than a couple of people working remote, suddenly the whole team needs to communicate, to up their communication game. As a positive fallout from that, it means that things are probably going to be better documented. It means that instead of just me telling you in the hallway, hey, here's how I fix that bug, and then you and I, you know, the, the, that information only exists in the sound waves between us. Instead, I'm more likely to document it on a wiki so that the new college grad that we hire in two weeks can also access that information. And that when I forget the thing that I told you in six months, which I absolutely will do, I can search our wiki for it and I can find that information. So that there, there's a potential upside to there as well. All right. Did that answer your question? Maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Sort of, all right. Um, Brooke, it is almost 5.30. Do we, I, I, I have time. I don't want to keep anybody. I don't know how your class works. So Brooke, if you would like to kind of chime in here and say how you'd like, um, how you'd like the rest of this to go. Absolutely. Hi guys. Um, yeah, I'm fine with going and dismissing anybody that is here from my classes. Um, but Chris has graciously offered to hang around a little bit longer. So if you do have a question that hasn't been answered yet, um, that you'd like to hang around and get answered, um, please do. And just a reminder to my students, like he said, sometimes this face-to-face -face communication, um, even on a Zoom call or a WebEx meeting, can be really helpful for uh, making sure that we're all on the same page, we're all understanding each other. So don't forget that I do have live office hours each week. So if you do have questions um, and want to see my face, um, we can definitely, definitely get them answered that way. So um, yes, you are dismissed if you're here for class, but also so um, we'll just keep going through some questions if you guys want to do that. And then I'll just, Chris, you can just close it out when you're ready at that point. Okay. okay. I've, I've got to answer this question here. Uh, what, what course did you hate the most in EE? Some, someone answered that. I got to ask that. It was, uh, it was 301, which was a signals and systems course. It was taught well. I had no idea what was going on in that course. Like none. It was terrifying. Um, which one I liked the most was uh, EE666. I saw that uh, BJ Kumar is still there. EE 666, which was a it was a parallel computer architecture course, it it was mind blowing because it combined like compilers and operating systems and computer architecture and hardware and like parallel systems. 
it combined them into one. And it was like, I want to say it was like a seven person class or something. And it was, it, it was a perfect culmination of, of everything, everything that I, that I liked about Purdue. It was just, it was a wonderful course. And, and Vijay Kumar was a fantastic teacher. So that, that was a good one. All right, if anyone, okay, we got Samantha. Let me allow you to talk. Hi, Samantha. Hi, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Uh, well, one, I wanted to say, like, I completely agree with you with 301. I took it last semester, and I completely had no idea what was going on. Right. Um, but sorry, uh, so my question really was, so with everything going on remotely, do you actually think, like, because I know that a lot of, um, a lot of things can be kind of like miscommunicated when it's not face to face. Like I know that when you're texting or emailing, you never really know what kind of tone someone's using. It's really difficult. So do you think that it actually, I feel like, do you think that it could be beneficial also to, to have this kind of relationship like over online because it kind of forces people to be like over communicate than what they actually would be doing in a face to face scenario? Yes, I, I love that question. The, the answer is yes. So I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a definitive answer, yes, not just an it depends to this question. If people over communicate and get, they will have to get better at communicating, if people have to explicitly think about communication, then that everyone wins. Everything gets better because things are communicated better. If, if I could say, so the older I get, the more, the more I, when, when I graduated college, I thought that sort of the technology mm -hmm. was like 98% of any successful project. If the tech was good, everything would be good. And the more, <laughs> the longer I go here, the more I see it. Technology is maybe like 20 to 30%, like having the right software, the right hardware, the right design is like 20 to 30% of the success of any particular project. But I think 70% of the success is, can the people work together well? Can they communicate? Are you designing something for the same system that I'm designing something for? And do you, expect the interfaces to be the same as the thing that I'm designing the thing to have the interface together. And that's all communication. It's mm -hmm. all communication. You know, whether you're a good programmer is important, but whether you're a good communicator is way more important. This is, this is a bar chart, right? This is a bar chart that adds up to a hundred. Here's 30%, here's 70%. Um, right. Maybe that answers your question. Maybe they got too preachy, but there you go. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's see. All right. Uh, all right. I think you are unmuted. Uh, so Chris, as a follow-up to the question that was just asked, when you talk about communication and you have a large project that you're working on, what is the design approach that you use? Or is there a smaller team that first lays the outline of the project and assigns people tasks? Or is it up to the people to come up with the requirements? Um, at a high level, I mean, every company, every group does it differently, but typically we will have um, a couple of senior people, you know, a senior hardware person, a senior software people, kind of what, whatever, whatever we think the project, you know, we're making a new robot and this robot is going to be a new vacuuming robot with some new system in it. So we'll get a couple of software people who are senior who have done a few robots like this. We get a couple of hardware people who have done the new hardware that's going to be in this robot. Um, we we kind of get them in the room. And then we usually get a project manager or someone who's, who's very good at sort of um, estimating and kind of helping us keep on task. And so a smaller team like that sits down and kind of sketches out sort of a napkin plan of, is this a six month, two person project, or is this a three year, 50 people project? And, you know, you start with a high level overview like that, which is very, very, you know, it, uh, the phrase t-shirt sizing is a phrase we use where you basically rank everything. Is it a small, is it a medium, is it a large or is it an extra large? sort of a task. So that there's very little, very little granularity there, but it gets you a quick and dirty view of, you know, is this a, is this a, a six month or a three year task? And then as you get further in the design and as the company kind of continues to, to say, yes, we want to keep working on this, it stays the priority. Then you, you go to more um, people who actually be doing the work and typically they will make estimates of, of more, you know, they'll expand the design and say, okay, we actually want a robot that does X, Y, Z, I'll give you the X part, I'll give you the Y part, I'll give you the Z, Z part, and then you all come up with your, your um, different, more, more specific tasks, and then hopefully those combine. And, um, you know, we're, we're not doing like a waterfall. We're not doing a, okay, we're starting in January 1, we're going to finish by December 31st. We try to be more, more um, agile, kind of more flexible than that. But the kind of the top-down flow is, is kind of what we use for, for a lot of our projects. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else want to raise their hand? It's been painless, hopefully, right? 
All right, let's see, we have Thomas. All right, Thomas, can you speak? I think it should work for you. We can't hear you, Thomas. If anyone else wants to raise their hand, we can put you in line here. Still can't hear you, Thomas. If no one else raises their hand while we wait for Thomas to figure out mic issues. Got to be someone else out there with a question. All right, Thomas, I'm going to I'm going to leave you unmuted. If you can figure out your mic, that's great. Let's see, Mohammed, you are up next. All right, Mohammed, let's see if we can hear your mic. Hi, hello, how are you? Ah, great, great. Hi. Uh, so first of all, thank you for uh, the piece of advice you gave us. They're pretty helpful. And I just had a question to ask. So you said you graduate as an EE, right? Yep. So uh, I'm also an EE too. And uh, um, I guess I'm sort of in the same situation that you might have been where <clears throat> you're doing sort of an electrical engineering sort of type degree, but then you sort of transition into you know, embedded systems and more sort of computer engineering, quote unquote, type things. So, I mean, what led you to make that transition? And, uh, and uh, yeah, how did you sort of accommodate it with you know, your, your, your classes and everything. And how did yeah. the sort of base classes benefit you as well later on? Okay, sure. So let, let me uh, start in the end. So the, I stumbled into computer architecture and chip design quite accidentally with my freshman year co-op. I didn't know any, I was 19. I had no idea what was going on. And I just stumbled into a co-op that was actually great. So I, you know, did the bachelor's, did the master's, did computer architecture as my focus with the master's degree got a job at AMD doing chip design. Um, it was it was quite fortunate. Um, I'm gonna say funny enough, it's not funny, but I actually interviewed with AMD on September 11th, 2001, which is you know a, a terrible day. But at that point, the economy was already in the toilet because um, dot com boom, or sorry, dot com bust was going on. And September 11th made the economy even worse, obviously terrible, terrible things happening. So in some respects, it was not too dissimilar from what we're doing now. Obviously, things are worse in different ways now. But anyway, I, I just I, I think that's that's an interesting interesting an analogy. But so I started in computer architecture. I did chip design at AMD for like eight years. I figured that would be the only job I'd ever want to have because I loved it and it was great. And I thought, man, that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of my career. And about five years in, quite frankly, I got bored. I got bored and I got kind of burnt out of doing chip design. And in my head. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a rule follower. One of the reasons I like schools because I'm very good at like checking boxes and, and you know taking the test and doing the thing that has been prescribed. And so I was going to be a computer architect and therefore that is all I could ever do. And I spent five years enjoying it. Then I kind of burned out and then I spent three years not really super enjoying my job. And my wife, who's a very patient and wonderful person, she was like, she's a, she's a psych major. She was a social worker. And so she said, I don't and what it is that you do as an engineer, she said, but is it really true that you can only do chip design? Is it really true that you can't get a job anywhere else? And it took about three years to get to my thick head that, you know what, actually the EE, ECE skill set is pretty broad. Maybe I could do something else. And I had a buddy who was doing embedded systems um, at a company called Silicon Labs, which is a great company. And if any of you are looking at working there, you should definitely should. Silicon Labs is a good company. Um, and he said, hey, we're hiring someone in my group that does low-level firmware. You know, you obviously understand chips because you've designed chips. You want to try it. And so I thought, you know what? I enjoyed Dr. Meyer's embedded classes. Um, it was called 362 at the time. I enjoyed that class back in the day, maybe. So I bought like a little $20 dev kit. Um, and I just kind of looked into it a little bit and I learned a little bit and relearned a little bit. Um, and I realized, yeah, I liked it. And so through my friend, I got a job uh, interview at Silicon Labs and they hired me. Um, at that point, you know, I could program C, C++, and I understood chips. So that was good enough to kind of to do, to do what, what they wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And I, that was 10 plus years ago. And it turns out I like that too. And I have not burned out or gotten bored of that yet. So that, that's kind of that transition. Um, I, I'm kind of going on more than your question because I want to encourage you all, especially if you are people like me who 
like have a little box and you like checking off box, you know, ticks, ticks and boxes, that your career is going to be 40 years long or more. And you may go get an MBA and decide you hate it. You may go find your dream job and actually stick with it for 30 years. And that's awesome. Or you may go find the first two jobs you have or three jobs you have kind of eh, but they don't really, they're not really what you're looking for. Try a new job. There's all kinds of tech out there. You're going to, you're going to pivot around. You're going to, you're going to end up doing different things. You know, 20 years ago, I did not think that I would be living in North Carolina. I did not think that I'd be working for a robotics company. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the answer. And if you don't mind, I just have one more question. Go for it. Uh, so just a, uh, so just a quick thing. What do you, so as a person in the embedded systems industry, what do you think is sort of, you know, the next big thing, quote unquote, it would be in the industry and like what uh, skills would you suggest that we sort of try to pick on, like pick up or technologies either in school or outside of school? Um, so that, that, that's a tough question. I mean, anytime you ask like sort of what's next, um, you know, I, I don't really know. I, IoT has started as kind of just a, a, a kind of a fluff word. And now, yeah, internet connectivity is basically on every silly device you could possibly want. Um, so any kind of connectivity, you know, in internet skills, which doesn't mean anything at all, but everything's gonna be connected to the internet. So having having some sort of knowledge of how that works, that doesn't mean you need to become a Wi-Fi expert or a Bluetooth expert or anything. But if you're into embedded systems, kind of having, having, that, uh, having that experience of connecting something to the cloud, and you know, pushing a button and having a website change as a result of pushing that button, that, and everything kind of along that chain is, for the last five years, has been the way things are going. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's certainly a trend. Embedded Linux used to be something that wasn't wasn't really a thing. Like you couldn't actually have Linux running on a chip that was uh, low power enough to really be considered embedded, and that's changing as well. Um, so em embedded Linux is a thing. But I mean, you can you can have a a perfectly healthy 20 year embedded career and never touch any of those things too. Okay. So th these are things that are kind of broad, but there's, I mean, if you're interested in something in embedded systems, go learn more about it because mm -hmm. odds are there's a million jobs out there that use it. There's, there's a million ways to make that, you know, a viable, uh, viable career. So don't, don't look at a list of technologies and then just, you know, pick them because they're popular. Instead, it's much better to, what are you interested in? What is your job? affording you the opportunity to do, what kind of research projects are available from professors at, professors at Purdue, and then, you know, check them out, learn something, and then see where that leads you. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you so much for your answers, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for your question. All right, let's see. Thomas, did you get your mic working? I feel bad for him. Are you all going to give Thomas a hard time if any of you know him later? You shouldn't. All right. Let's see. We've got. All right. Jahan? Hi, Chris. Uh, sorry, I have quite a few questions, but uh, I'm really interested in robotics and I've been looking for work opportunities, but it seems really difficult to do for a field like robotics where. For example, for any kind of slam work, you need a lot of experience or say a master's degree. How would you recommend I go about that or try and start working with something related to that? So robotics is a narrow enough field, um, which is both good and bad. The, you know, the many people we hire, especially people who are doing like kind of the more like the slam research and kind of the more cutting edge stuff, typically they're gonna have a master's or a PhD. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling you, oh, you should get a master's or PhD, but I'm saying a lot of people we hire to do that, we typically see them having a master's or PhD. You know, having a master's or PhD in robotics or any subject gives you two to four to six more years of learning about the broad field of robotics or computer architecture or whatever. And then, especially if you do a PhD, you're going to have some narrow, um, narrow research, narrow work that you are an expert on. So if you're looking at a field, whether it's robotics or anything, Take a look at what people what what the what people's careers look like. If most people have a master's or PhD, you probably need a master's or PhD to get into it. Um, you know that that being said, are, are you an undergrad? I assume. Yes. All right. So you know, have you considered grad school? I have, but uh, so for this question in particular, I was thinking of internship opportunities, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I didn't really know what kind of internship to apply for that will help me build towards 
a career in robotics, for example? I mean, the, the, the cheap answer is any, any robotics company that you can find, um, you know, whether it's a startup or whether it's someone like iRobot, where, you know, we're medium sized or whether it's some like giant company with you know, tens of thousands of people. Basically, if, if their work is robotics, then getting yourself in that building and doing something around robotics is better than, you know, the, the random web development internship that you might find. Um, so I, I don't have any specific advice around that um, other than, yeah, getting, getting something in the robotics, in the robotics space. You know, you, you go out to Silicon Valley, you go to Boston, those are two big hubs for robotics companies. So those, those are the places to look for them as far as um, in, in the continental US anyway. I know like Switzerland has, has a fair amount, Germany has a fair amount, um, the UK has a little bit. So I'm not sure if that answers your question specifically enough. But yeah, thank you, it helps. All right, great. I see 36 people online here. If, if, if you're 36 people have questions, you should totally ask your question. All right, I see Thomas is on, I'm gonna try Thomas again. All right, Thomas, is your mic working now? I saw you unmute yourself, but I can't hear you. That is a shame. Thomas, if you email your question to Brooke, I will answer it afterwards. I will directly email you the answer to your question. Anyone else have questions? Otherwise, I'll go through this list some more until you all get bored of hearing me. Let's see. I got an internship as a software engineer. How can I stand out and prove myself amongst other peers working from home if my final goal is to land a full time at the same company? All right, so this is a good question. So the best type of internship, or I shouldn't say the best type, but the, the best outcome perhaps, and this, this is maybe me being selfish, but the best outcome is we hire an intern and then an internship is basically, you know, a three or four month long interview where you get to work for the company and see if you like the company and see if you like the manager and see if you like the coworkers and the work. And then I get to interview you for three months to see if you can do the work. You know, obviously as an intern, we understand you are an intern. You have fewer years of experience than people who have graduated or have worked for 20 years. But the way to distinguish yourself and the type of people that I want to hire are people who work hard, who ask questions, who don't go off, you know, for three or four days. And, you know, you need to struggle with work a little bit. If you come and ask questions every 30 seconds, that's going to be a little bit annoying. But sort of admit what you know, admit what you don't know, and be totally honest with that, and then just make progress and work hard on, on whatever it is, um, whatever work you're, you're being given. Um, the, that answer is, is sort of so generic that it's not very helpful, but I guess the trap that I see, especially a lot of younger students, um, uh, interns, I guess, and, and even like earlier term um, full-time employees fall into is that you don't want to ask questions because you don't want to be perceived as being dumb or, or not knowing what you're doing. Um, there's, a, there's a thing called imposter syndrome. I don't know if you've ever talked about imposter syndrome. Have, raise your hand in the chat if you've ever heard of imposter syndrome. Let's see who's paying attention. A few of you. So, okay, great, thank you. So imposter syndrome is basically this thing where you feel like a fraud and you feel like everyone else knows everything and you're the only fool in the room who doesn't know what's going on. Um, let me tell you that imposter syndrome is alive and well in the professional industry. I've, I've asked questions of my colleagues. Um, I said, hey, who here feels imposter syndrome? Who, who feels like, you know, you've been working for 20 years as a software engineer at iRobot. You helped to invent the Roomba. Um, do you have imposter syndrome about the fact that you're a good software engineer? And about two thirds of the room raises their hand. And it's always, it's always fun to do in a meeting because two thirds of the room is their hand. You look around and you're like, you're the most senior developer at the company. Like you invented the Roomba software. How can you have imposter syndrome? If anything, the rest of us are imposters and you are the real deal. Um, psychologically, apparently we most of us have imposter syndrome. So if you can get over that and realize that ask honest questions as often as you can, then if, if an employer thinks it's bad for you to be asking questions a lot, you don't wanna be there. You, you don't want to be there anyway. So that, that's a good way to sort of self-select out your, yourself out of a bad company. Um, if they see that, oh, okay, you're willing to admit what you don't know, you're willing to learn whenever you need to learn something, and then you'll complete your work. And if that cycle continues, that's kind of generic, but hopefully that's useful advice. Let's see, done with that one. Uh, Abhay, um, do you want to ask a question, Abhay? Or were you, were you raising your hand from uh, from the previous thing? I 
I'm going to assume they were just raising their hand from previous. All right, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Let's see. Uh, I think Abhay's is actually in the webinar chat. Um, do you think the way people personify Roombas and starships, do you see that one? Yes, yes, yes. Do you, do you think that okay. the way people uh, personify Roombas and starships and refer to them affectionately lower the likelihood of human robot conflicts? I am completely unqualified to answer this question and I will answer this question. Um, yes, first of all, it is, it is awesome. People name their Roombas and we, we love that. It is so funny, and we all name our Roombas. My, my wife has named most of our Roombas. Um, will it will it lower the likelihood of human robot conflicts? I don't know what a human robot conflict looks like apart from like sci-fi. Um, you know, us us treating robots like friends or like pets. Actually, I, it seems like that's okay. I suppose if the robots ever take over and they're offended that we treated them like pets, that seems like a problem. Um, I can tell you it hurts me physically when I, when I see, you know, the, the big dog robot that Boston Dynamics has, it, it's a giant big dog looking robot. And the videos, at least some older ones, show them kicking the robot over and then watching it get up or they would like hit it or something or poke it with sticks. I see that and I think that is not a good idea. If the robots ever take over, you don't want to be the guy that hit a robot with a hockey stick. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but you should be kind to robots and animals. It seems like that just, everyone wins if we do that. That's just some good life advice right there. Be it kind really to robots is. and animals just across the board. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Um, a question just came in. Are you still hiring interns? So we are, uh, most companies, the way they do hiring, at least for summer interns, is you know, starting in September, we, we try, we scramble to find, to find good people for internships for the next summer. Um, so I believe all of iRobot's intern slots are, are currently full for this year but uh, hopefully that answers that question. Let's see. Oh, Thomas, hand up, we're gonna try it. All right, Thomas, you're on. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just switched mics, sorry. But, uh, I'm so excited to talk to you. You've built, you've built the <laughs> suspense, and now this is, this is it, man. Um, this is kind of a general question, but as an intern or someone who, you've probably had a lot of interns in your time, um, if you don't like the project you're on that summer or that co-op semester, uh, what do you go about talking to your boss or going out and talking to more people? How do you go about that? that that's tricky. I mean, that, that's, it's, it's a great question. That, that's a tricky question. Um, you know, you, you don't know what you're getting when, when, you, when you sign up, right? Um, some, some companies actually say, okay, you know, when we hire you as an intern, we know you're going to do this task. And some companies say, hey, we're hiring in September. We don't know what we're going to be doing in May. And We'll let you know. So it is kind of a gamble. Um, depending on your rapport with the with your manager and what what their personality is like, um, you know, you may be able to say, "Hey, I'd like to come back, but I'd like to do a different kind of work." Um, you, it's a very personal situation. They may get offended by that. That may affect your review. Um, they may be open to it and they may say, yeah, sorry, it wasn't a great project. Sorry, it worked out that way. Or they may try to help you dig in. Like, what about it didn't you like? Did you not like the topic? Did you not like the work environment? Did you not like the, you know, what about it didn't you like? And what, can you find anything you did like? Even if your manager is not willing to have that conversation, even if you don't feel like it's an environment where you can have that productive conversation, it's worth asking yourself, first of all, what about it did you not like? Um, so that you can hopefully find some patterns, you know, Okay, you, you wrote a program to do X. So did you not like the domain it was in? Did you not like the coworkers? Did you not like the way you had the check-in code? Did you not like the code review process? Was it mean or was it absent? Or were you alone and left ignored for three weeks? Try to figure out what it is that you liked and didn't like so that at the very least you can find that pattern elsewhere and either, I mean, obviously go to the things you like and avoid the things you don't like. Um, if you all, I think, so when I was, when I was a Purdue, we had the co-op program and so you, you would do three or four terms with the same company, usually in different groups. And there, because the company signed up to have you come back several times, it was more explicit that, oh, did you like the first group you were in? We can put you back in that group. Or if you didn't like the second group you were in, we won't, we won't send you back there. We can find somewhere else for you to go. So that's an easier conversation to have. Um, did, that, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, and also along with that, um, 
like what you did where you kind of got bored of your job once you were in the field, how do you go about transitioning within your own job or within your own company? It's, it's tough. It depends on, it depends on what your company is, you know, a bigger company is going to have more options, you know, more, more sorts of work. A smaller company is going to have less sorts of work because it's a smaller company and those are rules of thumb. So, you know, part of it is realizing, are you bored for a week? Or are you bored for a month? And when do you decide to do something about it? And the thing that you do about it is what else do you want to try? You know, if you have an inclination for what you want to try, then look for it in your own company. Try to try to sort try of create your own job or, you know, if you like testing, but you hate writing, you know, software, then try to make your job into destructive testing because it turns out you actually like breaking things more than making things or vice versa. Um, the, you know, how, how open your boss is to you saying, hey, I'm kind of getting burned out. Can we try something different? It totally depends on your boss, totally depends on your company. You know, your career is yours to manage over the length of your career. I think I think that there can be this perception that you go to work and your boss's job is to make sure you have a good career. And maybe that's an older mindset or something, but that's definitely, that's definitely not true. You need to own your career. And so that means you need to sort of be self-aware enough to say, what do I like? What do I not like? What else might I like to try? Can I find somewhere in the company to make the shift or to try to make the shift, which is pretty much always easier than quitting your job and finding a new job to do something that you don't have experience doing. It's, it's a harder sell that way. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a bunch of vague, vague advice. I don't know if that helps at all. All right, what else? Anyone else have questions? We're still up to 31 people. I figured you all would have bugged out by now. Anyone else has other questions, please raise your hand and we can answer them. Here's one, uh, you talked about coming up with good habits and sticking to them. I understand this is important and I've been trying to do the same, but I feel like all my days feel exactly the same. How do you maintain, uh, do you recommend uh, introducing variation into your day while maintaining consistency? So I'm guessing there's some like boredom and there's some kind of, oh, this is the same, the same old grind. There's, there's a good element to having sameness and that there's also kind of a boredom to it. Um, if, if you can make little tweaks to it here and there, go for it. Um, I don't, I don't really have any, any, any tips on how you might introduce variation into that, unfortunately, other than, you know, just, just keep trying stuff. Try, try tweaking it, try turning the day around, try changing stuff, see how it works for a week, go back to how it was before, but it's not any better. Let's see. What would you recommend for people who want more breadth quicker than working in a variety of places? More breadth quicker than working in a variety of places. I think this person is asking um, basically what, what if, you, if you want breadth, if you want to get a, a lot of experience doing different things, what would you, what would you look for? And um, I know some companies have rotational programs, like graduate engineer programs or graduate rotational engineer programs where I think GE is one of them where you go in and you know you're going to get three months in four different jobs or something like that. And so, you know, you're going to get a very intentionally different look at four different types of groups. Um, if you can intern at three different types of companies over the summer or, or even co-op at a company that's big enough that has four different divisions, then you can get, you know, get, get that kind of a view. Um, you know, if you go work for a company, work there for a year or two and you don't like it, go find a new job. And you, you know, you do that a few times and you've got three or four companies who you, um, you tried out. Um, the, the, the downside, and I don't know how much Purdue is warning you about this, but you know, if, if I get a resume from somebody and they've done like a six month job and then a six month job and a six month job and a six month job, you do it a few times and it starts to look like people are kind of job hoppers and you worry, well, if I hire them, are they going to work for me for six months and then get bored and, and split? Um, there's some people who, you know, you just get unlucky and you find four jobs in a row that are bad jobs. And that, that absolutely happens. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question. But uh, I see that this person's name is, uh, but uh, the person who answered that question is, sorry, the recent person who asked that question is online. And if they want to raise their hand and explain better, I can hopefully answer it better. But otherwise, we'll leave it at that.
I think I got a bunch of questions about master's versus bachelor's degree. I think I answered those. Um, I'm very glad I have a master's degree. What I think about going back after a couple of years in industry, I think I, I think I touched on that earlier. Basically, if you don't have a field you're particularly excited about, it's quite okay to go work for a couple of years and then go back and get your master's. If it turns out, oh, hey, I like this field and having a master's would let me do better in my career because of it. Many companies pay for master's degrees too. Um, so that's one way to do it. The problem there is that, you know, especially if you, uh, you get addicted to having a salary and then uh, if you have to quit to go back to school, your salary goes down quite a bit, but uh, that, that's uh, plenty of people do it. It's, it's a fine option. Let's see. There's a bunch of kind of career questions in here, but I think, I think we're kind of winding down a little bit. Um, also my voice is fading. Let's see. So I'm going to say if there's any more kind of la last call for questions, if you have anything, either type them in or go ahead and raise your hand. Otherwise, we can call this done in just a few minutes here. Um, I just want to thank you again for doing this. I have to say, though, I might... Uh, <clears throat> might need you to come to campus because I've never had students stay a half hour after I dismissed them. So that's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that like their Wi-Fi is hung and they're just stuck on there because their <laughs> thing hasn't cleared yet. But uh, I'm going to say it's because they have to rush off to another class right after mine. So that's good. Uh, you know, you have, we have a captive audience now since we're all stuck at home. Um, but I do really appreciate this. Um, and I think we'll have this link available if you're okay with that. Yep. Um, so students can, you know, look at it again, or those that weren't able to come. I know a couple of my students had other Zoom meetings during this time. Um, but yeah, we just appreciate this so much. Um, and uh, this is, like I said, been really helpful um, for me as well. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I enjoyed it. I'm very, I hope, I hope a little bit was helpful. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of it is not applicable, but I'm sure some of it hopefully is a little bit helpful. And these are great questions. I, I hope that, I uh, hope that I answered some and, yeah, I'll get you a link to this so you can post it and uh, hopefully it's helpful. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. All right. Thank you all very much.